Hello, and welcome to the Psychic Stories podcast, encouraging conversations about mental health. Today, I'm speaking to Kate Wallace. Kate, hi. Hello, hi. How are you getting on? Good, thank you. Yep, managing pretty well now. Uh, my son's back at nursery. Good. <laughs> a big difference. A big yes, difference I can imagine. The work output. <laughs> and and your balance, right hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's definitely uh, made me feel a bit less pushed between work and looking after him at the same time. Yeah, that must be very intense. So, so the goal of um, what we're talking about today is to have an open and honest conversation about your mental health journey, to get some insight into the tools and techniques that have helped you and are available and accessible to other people. And by discussing your journey, we hope to share normalised conversations about mental health, as often people are not alone in these experiences. Does that sound good with you? It does. Great idea. I'm really, really pleased to be part of it. Awesome. Well, we're very, very happy to have you. And I'll now stop talking and would love to hear about your mental health journey. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So my mental health journey actually started about five years ago when my son Henry was born, our son Henry. Before that, I had had no instances that I was aware of, of any mental health problems, worries, anxieties, particularly um, I think now, looking back, maybe there were instances. Mm. I just I feel like I recognise them now because of the things that have happened in the last five years. And mm. um, so I think really it's kicking off with him being born, seeing much wanted, much found baby, um, and everything was fine. I think fast birth, but everything was fine. But I think within I think almost pinpoint the day where I felt things were just not going well, and that was when he was ten weeks old. Mm. And I've never been very aware of how people should be feeling when they have a baby. And I read too much. So I guess, again, it's like somebody who researches and reads a lot about something happening to them. Mm. Probably you might, in hindsight, think they have issues around control and wanting to know what's going to happen. Mm. And, um, but, and I didn't fit um, what people would often describe as having postnatal depression. I didn't feel anxious about his health. I didn't feel, I wasn't teary. I wasn't um, sort of depressed in the, what I guess would be the sort of classic sense. But what I did have a lot of was a lot of anger, irritation, bad temper, snappiness, and general feeling of just, I'm not enjoying this in any way, shape, or form. And actually, unlike a lot of people in that scenario, I, I sought help really quickly. I went to see a health visitor and I said, He's fine. I don't feel like I'm fine. And so they were everyone very responsive when postnatal people say this sort of thing. I put on a mother and baby course, which is like a chatting course with local people in my area. And, you know, like always, things, yes, it helps in a weird way. It's nice to talk to other people who are feeling a bit. There was a course for people who are low, anxious and depressed. And actually, again, I wouldn't have said I fitted into that category. And when I walked into that room and we all told our stories, I was one that came off as the bouncy, happy, totally in control, fine woman in that room. Mm. Um, and I guess some of that is about putting on a facade and you know, being, um, feeling like, well, everyone else is feeling crap. It's my job to help everyone feel better in a weird way, even though it totally wasn't I was there because I was part of that group, but I didn't feel like I was. Um, and I also, one of my siblings, I'm one of four and two sisters that had babies all very happy and easily and without any particular problems, certainly from their own mental health perspective. And my sister just said, I remember her coming out and seeing me one day and I was just crying, being like, I don't know how I'm ever supposed to feed this baby other than myself feeding it. Because I have, if you don't do it within a certain number of weeks, it's all going to go wrong. Anyway, she obviously was like, this is weird. Mm. And without even asking me, so problematic, um, just booked an appointment with a psychiatrist that she knew, took my baby from me and said, I'm having him for the day. She already had two quite small kids herself. You go off and see this person. Wow. And it was just quite well, and this is, um, I don't know if I should have listened to this. I just didn't feel like I had any choice or any option. I had quite interfering family, and so they were involved as well. And the psychiatrist said to me, quite an eminent guy in, you know, in Wimpole Street or whatever. And he's like, oh, you know, you're borderline. 
basically you do these questionnaires, and I probably took this questionnaire or variations of it three or four times, mm. which is you know, asking you questions about your mental health. And I just I was answering it truthfully, but I was always borderline, you're borderline postnatally depressed. And and that was one of the worst things to hear in a way that it wasn't very clear cut. And I remember him saying to me, you can take pills or you can do you know, you can do therapy, you've got all these different options. What you can't do is nothing. And that advice has really stuck with me in some ways, because actually, if you look at what happened to me over the sort of following two years, I never did nothing, but all the things I did do weren't quite right. So in between that February, when Henry was five months old, um, we had, so I had a psychiatrist, I didn't, I didn't go on the pills then, I was like, I don't want to do that, I don't think I need to do that, I'll try other stuff first. So you've got a sleep trainer in, although again, Henry wasn't a typical baby. You know, that was me trying to get control of the situation. And it worked to a point. I was in control, but then I was wedded to this routine that I could not stop doing. And I loved it and it worked for me. But I think again, in hindsight, did that help that I was in this completely obsessive routine for him? I don't know. But it's hard to know, it's chicken and egg. You know, was, did my mental health mean I needed the routine or was the routine affecting my mental health yeah. I think it's a really blurred area for me um, but overall I think it was a good I do think it was a good thing um, and then I also was referred to have so I went to see a GP and I was referred for uh, CBT therapy and that was to do with I think I was referred to that again very people move very fast when you've had a baby so I mean, normally a NHS waiting list would have been months for CBT therapy, but I got put into, you know, I was on a six week course uh, for with very, very quickly, given about 10 days of saying yeah. I'll stop bringing this number of the GP. Every time I had an intervention with a GP or with a health visitor, they'd say, try this. And then I'd wait a bit and then things would, there would be an episode of some kind. I'd have some sort of outburst, yeah. which would make, which would then push me to do whatever that initial recommendation had been. So in that case, it was bringing St George's healthcare team saying, I'm really, this, this just doesn't feel right. Mm. And I guess it would make me laugh about CBT, because I can see how it helps to people who have genuinely irrational fears and phobias, like spiders. So for me, you know, and I was like, oh, you know, I think something might be wrong. If, you know, if his routine is that he sleeps two hours in a day, and he always does that, and one time he doesn't, there might be something wrong. Well, actually, that is quite a rational, I wouldn't call it a fear, but it's a rational, it is a rational thought yeah. that something isn't right. So again, not worried about his health or anything particularly, but just this is all going wrong and that's completely throwing me off when things would just, when things would shift, which is, you'll know, Matt, with a baby, obviously that's shifting all the time. So um, it wasn't the most useful, helpful scenario to be in. Um, and... I sort of carried on on that and I remember my mum saying to me, what can we do to help? What can we do to help? Because, you know, I just wasn't happy. I wasn't enjoying any of it. Mm. Would it be better if you went back to work? And I was like, oh, no, I can't go back to work because I've got the whole summer ahead of me and that might be really amazing. That might be the thing that changes everything, makes me feel different and better. Um, but actually, maybe in hindsight, going back to work would have been a good, would have been a good thing. Um, but I just didn't know what help I needed. I didn't know what help I needed. What could you to help? I don't know. I don't actually know really what's wrong with me. I just don't think I'm enjoying this as much as other people are. And not even seem to be, like in an Instagram way, just my direct experience of other people and their children was much more like, yeah, it's annoying when they have a tantrum or it's annoying when they cry a lot, but you, know, you just get through it. Well, I just didn't have that attitude. I was like, why is he doing what I want him to do when I want him to do? So it was filled with that, like you said, that anger and frustration. It was, yeah, it was genuinely, it was, it was rage a lot of the time. And that's just not an emotion that most people talk about in the context of children or small yeah. children. Um, I mean, it's all like pushing buttons and stuff, but like the actual rage of it not happening or you know, in, individual things not happening the way I wanted them to happen. Um, so, so just taking it, just taking it back slightly to like that first time you said when Henry was ten weeks old. Like, 
can, can you describe the like the first 10 weeks like what was that like as a as a new mum and then maybe well that point you said it just tipped like what, what, what how did you feel what, what, what happened did you wake up one day and well, I know I can well, say it's so lame I can still remember this because as, as I've said to you it's about, it was nearly five years ago and um, up until that point I think things had just just things were just had a sort of a, you know things just happen in a, in a sort of order as it were you know you come out of hospital Richard my husband um you know was with us for a week but actually dads aren't massively useful and um, strictly for your breastfeeding so fair point, fair that point. Work after one week and we arranged to have you know a different second week of pat leave um further down the line um it just sort of was i'd had no euphoria no i didn't have any joy in it I wasn't like, oh, I love you. But then again, I'd read, I knew that people were told like, oh, you fall in love with your baby when you see them was basically bullshit. So I didn't, I wasn't, I was almost so not expecting to have those feelings. Because not only did it not bother me when I didn't have them, um, that it just, it didn't feel like there was anything necessarily missing because I wasn't necessarily expecting to have that. Is, is it? Yeah, it's interesting you use that word expecting. I was just thinking about the expectation, especially with all the amount that you've read. Did you have this very clear image of what you thought you were expecting to experience going from pregnancy to having actually doing it? I just don't, I'm not 100% sure. I thought mm. that in my head, I think everything happens so easily and quickly for us. I decided I want to have a baby, bam, pregnant straight away. Um, you know, things were happening in the order, and I felt like I had reasonable exposure and experience um, with with nephews and nieces um, going back to you know my in my mid-20s I've, I've had nephews and nieces so I, I don't know whether I think I was expecting to be very practical which I am in lots of ways um, but that yeah I just I think I can't explain it but I just know that those 10 weeks were just I don't look back on any of it. This is probably why there is not going to be a second baby because I, there's nothing I look back on where I think, oh yeah, I want to revisit that. I want to do that again mm. at all. Um, and it's very hard to know whether that is looking through this sort of lens of actually when I was then diagnosed with, with postnatal depression when Henry was two and nearly two, well, two and a half years old, pretty much. It will take a couple of months. Um, so it took that long with um, all these different interventions, because I've only told you about the first three, there's at least another four that came mm -hmm. after, uh, after the CBT therapy, which, you know, they give you all these techniques. And I just felt like I was really, you know, obviously very grateful to be offered it and, and to be able to have access to that therapy. Um, but probably the best thing out of it was that I had an hour a week for six weeks away from Henry. Mm -hmm. I felt fraught with organizing that. Mm -hmm. um, Again, even though I had access to you know, the financial means to have somebody, um, and actually, even though my parents paid for it, it wasn't even to do with money. My parents were just like, whatever you need, we'll throw it at you. But I had this weird feeling of, I don't really want to spend time with him. I'm not really enjoying it. But the idea of someone else being in charge of him fills me with even more sort of horror. And, and dread and I you know all, all my sister always offering to take him and I was like you've already got, got two kids and she was pregnant with a third look at you're finding this so easy you just want to add to your shed load of stuff with my kid and I can't even manage him yeah. and it's just him is how it, that's how it felt I mean she, she would vociferously deny that being her intention or her what she was thinking um but I, but that, that's how I took it and that, you know, that did some damage to our relationship, I think. Um, and that time, that must have been such a confusing and conflicted set of emotions, both going on in your head and also trying to articulate them to your loved ones as well. Because how do, you were saying you spoke a lot to your sister and your parents. Um, how about your husband? <laughs> well, yes, you just thought he would, he would be up there in the list of people that would be up <laughs> And um, obviously he was the closest to it. Mm. And... He is a very pra he's a very practical guy, um, and not massively emotional, I would say. Be careful because I'm sure he'll listen to this. Um, and I think he, if you ask him now, what would he have done differently? His exact words are: "We would have pulled the chain sooner and got you to see someone who 
just could have got you to that position we found ourselves in two and a half years later mm. and meandering between acupuncture therapy um, the cbt the groups the breathing apps um and everything else in between he would i think he just felt that there were so many voices yeah. telling, you what we, telling you how we should handle or telling me how i should handle it um and it's we, interesting you're you you you're stuck in the middle with all these voices actually, going was, yeah that's very true i felt very stuck in the middle because he felt my family to be excessively interfering on the topic but i think i didn't know we haven't really talked about it but my sister I'm pretty sure contacted him and said what are we gonna you know what do you think we should do about kate um so you know that i think a lot of people around me knowing things were not right and i wasn't even particularly brushing it off I and mean, that's the thing all the way along i did always say I hate it. There's nothing to enjoy about it whatsoever. Um, and so I think, well, and it's interesting, some of the things that I was doing to help, uh, especially later down the line. So by the time we get to, I've got I've written a timeline here to help me remember because it's, it's crazy looking back at it. But by February 2017, I had gone, I had started doing therapy, sort of proper weekly therapy, individual therapy. And um, there's also, I mean, again, it's hard to know, uh, what could be relevant to study, what the therapist felt was relevant, is that I was born 13 weeks prematurely. Uh, and it sounds weird to say that it even might be relevant, but there is, I was, it felt a bit like, why am I so different from my siblings, who've all coped fine? And I thought you could argue, you know, one in, probably is one in four probably for people that have postnatal depression. Um, so maybe that fits just, with, just on a statistical front from that point of view. But I was born very early. Um, so I had, I didn't have myself a normal start to mother-baby bonding, and there are a number of psychological, potentially sort of flat trap things. But there are some thoughts about um, your own experience and how that might impact your experience with your own children. Um, that, that, that's incredible, isn't it? That some thirty years ago, when you were <laughs> It's even you know minus several weeks old that that could have led to the feelings that perhaps that you are you were feeling at that time yeah i mean my like i say the, the therapist who reasons they were regarded um and the theory if anyone's interested in looking into it is called ghost the ghosts in the nursery and of course you see extreme versions you know children who've been neglected and, and all sorts of horrible things mm. and their ability their impact um so i didn't have anything obviously like that but i wasn't i was basically not touched um, other than by medical professionals for the first 13 plus weeks of my life. Mm. And I was touched, it was usually with a lot of needles um, and you know, there's a lot of pain, I mean, there would be a lot of physical pain associated. I don't know, it could be complete bollocks, but um, there is, is something in, so we do, you know, in therapy and things, we were talking not just about my current experiences, but you know, my place in my family, being the third out and all sorts of interesting things. So I did start to find all that really interesting and I found as everything's got better with Henry, my conversations in therapy would actually not really be about him at all. Um, the point where I got to be just complaining about people at work. Yeah. <laughs> things are fine. Um, and then I had a big hit, like, hit problem when he, uh, he decided to drop his nap at two years and three months. And again, just the rage when he just wouldn't do what he was expected to do. And it was too yeah. early to drop his nap. Mm -mm. Um, so that's, and what the, sorry, the crunch in terms of time is what led to uh, what I think is the thing that actually helped fix things for me, or was the most transformative, um, was a very good friend of mine bearing witness, is the only way to describe it, to an epic meltdown of Henry's, but with me as well, and me completely losing everything um, within her, in her house. And she's a GP, and uh, she said, you know, because every time you say to anyone, you know, I say I was always very open about how I was feeling, but everyone was like, oh, I know, it's so awful, isn't it? And oh, it's so difficult. But when someone actually witnesses your reaction, when, when my friend Laura witnessed my reaction to this meltdown of Henry's and how, what it did to me mentally, um, she was a bit like, oh, yeah. Mm. I've got a really good colleague at my surgery, which actually, as it happens, is, is my surgery. Um, at her, uh, she said, I've got this great colleague, and she's, she's sort of a mentor for me, and she's got three boys, she really knows her stuff. 
I think, I think maybe it would be really good if you went to see her. And I had already made another appointment to go and see some, a different GP. And I remember two of my friends who were, who were medical professionals saying, oh, how old is she? Does she have, you know, does she, does she have children about this doctor? Of course, I didn't really ask it for man or not. But um, I said, oh, no, well, she seems quite young. I looked her up and they're like, oh, you know, I think if you can see someone who's just sort of been through it a bit more, that might help. And um, anyway, my friend then managed to help me get this appointment with this, this wonderful doctor who, um, I walked in, this is in January 2018, I walked in and I said, I've basically been miserable for the last two and a half years. Burst into tears, I said, I've tried all these things. Therapy, acupuncture, acupuncture, actually, my husband would say, did see a difference. Like the day that I'd had it, there would be, there would be a difference. Um, and, you know, he'd I'd go in and he'd feel me and he'd say, oh yes, I know what to, what's happened to you this week. And he would, I would then that would say anything, it's very creepy. Um, and it gets, so all these little things did have little bits of help, small interruptions and changes. Um, but anyway, so I thought I'd be miserable. And then she said, well, you know, what I think this is, Kate, is postnatal depression that has just been left to go on a little bit too long. Um, and I really, really would recommend that you go on some antidepressants. I think it will help. I said, oh, but, you know, I've just signed up for this breathing app. I'm, gonna, I'm starting to do some more exercise. You know, if I just do that for the six weeks, what do you think? She said, yes, yes, you could. I mean, you should always carry on those things. Mm -hmm. um, but you will be back to see me in six weeks, and we will still be in the same position. But I will be suggesting that you go on antidepressants. And so I said, okay, fine. That must um, be quite, quite a thing to hear. Yeah, no, it was. And she was, she's... And I still now, I like, I don't know what I've got on going on. I'm like, I need to see Dr. Andrews. <laughs> because I just, I trust her so much in that she, it was the first person to really sort of saying, well, you could, you could do this and see how you get on. And she was the first person to be like, no, none of that stuff is going to make the difference to you in your situation, given what you've said. So I guess there was an element of her really listening to me rather than just saying, oh, here's, you know, and I, you know, of course, the person doing my acupuncture was like, well, of course you can go on antidepressants and just numb your brain. So, so much um, anti-feeling about, <clears throat> about antidepressants. Um, but by that point, I feel like I had done everything else and there wasn't really anything left in the arsenal of anybody um, that was going to help. And, and as my mother said, and it was true, that Henry was going to start to notice how it felt about him. Um, which which wasn't always massively positive, um, and I'm really happy to say that you know, well, hey, thank God this pandemic didn't happen two and a half years ago because uh, <laughs> wow, we got sort of come out of it. But um, you know, those that that doctor saying that you know I can see you tried everything, I can see you really want to to things to change, and I really think this is going to be the thing that will help you. And if it's not, we can try something else, but I really do believe it. And she said, you know, and it's fine. If you need to be on them until he goes to school, mm. fine. If you need to have another baby, if you want to have another baby, we can make that happen. Mm. But I just think it will really help. And I have to say, you know, I started taking them. I was, <laughs> we were going away for a weekend. And I was like, oh, I just, I don't think I don't want to do it yet. Well, Wally was, there. Wally was going away, for, Richard was going away for a weekend. And I was like, oh, I, you know, they did say, she said, I wouldn't start them. You know, Mitch was on the round, this is you know, what happened. Which also puts a bit of God in you, like, well, yeah. you do read the most horrific side effects. Um, I, was, I, was, I was prescribed sertraline and I was prescribed the standard therapeutic dose, which I think is, I think it's 50 milligrams. It wasn't huge, I don't think. Um, dose, I'd have to go back and look. Um, and I started taking them and within two days felt a huge difference, a huge difference, not in a sort of numbing, miserable way, just in a, my ability to cope with what was going on around me, particularly with Henry and actually even with Wally to an extent. Um, I, one of the things that I, I had had quite badly in this period was um, noise sensitivity. So I've always found like a ring telephone to be nigh on impossible to, to ignore. Um, and actually, again, that's what I mean with hindsight. You kind of think, oh, well, actually, 
fine, no one's going to ring the telephone. Maybe a crying baby is not going to be something that I'm going to be able to manage terribly well. Um, and straight away, my tolerance for it all became so much more measured um, and, and relaxed is the only way to describe it. So there's no, there was no sense of feeling um, sort of desensitized. I mean, well, sorry, I have obviously described a situation of being desensitized, but it, I see it more as my intolerance of noise was out of whack with the norm and those pills brought me to a more normal level um, in, my, in my ability to cope. It's interesting how you describe it because like you said you say you went to see and, and often you hear you know completely you know i'd say wrongly you know like you said with when you saw the your ac acupuncturist that you know you're going to numb your brain and and it's a it's a it, you know you're 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 numbing your feelings your emotion you're not going to feel anything but how you've articulated is something very very different it's i'm now able to cope which is still means you've got feelings right oh um, yeah no absolutely but actually well, i should say something i described to a friend of mine and even now she's like oh i always want you to write it down um less i uh, genuinely three or four days after i started taking them henry's eyes looked more sparkly to me wow. i was seeing him in a completely different way that's so, amazing right that's like it's a weird thing to say completely wow but, i mean it's amazing i mean your awareness your perception changed in a way yeah wow. yeah it did it really did. And, it's, and, and I don't see it, I don't even think of it as like, oh, there was this massive fog and this sort of cleared it because I'm not sure I could even recognise that there was a fog. I just thought it was, it was me that, unless you have, and this is why, I find, what I find most fascinating about postnatal depression is when you've had someone, someone who's had a baby and not had it, and then had another baby and had it. They knew yeah. anyone how it can feel. I didn't know that. This was my first baby and I didn't know. Not only did I not know how it could feel, but I'd read so much, actually, probably in hindsight, quite negative stuff about having a baby. Months mm. now, months now, but I'm pretty sure that you hear about the shit more than you hear about the great on. on yeah, good old, like good old mum's net. I do know. Well, I mean, I'm my friends. Anyone who hears this, who, who knows me, will be like, I can't be talking about mum's net because I do. Yeah. I do really. Well, enjoy honestly. It. I in it, at three o'clock in the morning when something's going on with my daughter, I've been on mum's net, and it is <laughs> it is quite a read. It is, it is. But like I say, like I say, I think it is obviously you are going to hear more negative stuff. So I think I was so geared up for it to yeah. be, it didn't feel like a surprise um, that it wasn't. So like that's what I mean about my expectation not being of unicorns and rainbows, mm. but actually almost it was already quite low expectation, and then it was even worse than that. Yeah. Really. So I mean, it was, it's, it's amazing how you described that. How you said Henry's eyes sparkled more. Could you tell the difference between how you were perceiving not just Henry, but the world around you compared to maybe 10 years before? Like, Well, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because actually, I, it's not like I looked at other people's children and like, oh, their eyes look sparkly before. So I can't even say that, oh, I wasn't seeing something in him that I've seen in other people because mm. I sure that when it's your I think maybe I was probably seeing more like oh this is what other people see yeah. when they have their own children um uh I, I just know what was happening 10 years before well, okay no I, I think like in terms of the world around you did things seem brighter yeah well yeah well, yes I think I think the way I've talked about Henry probably that is reflected more generally and um, you know yeah. it with Wally became easier um there had been a lot of tension uh, around me seeing the therapist, actually, be wrongly, but I think, um, I think that came from I'd come home from sessions with her, and part of what I'd been complaining about would have been him, and so there often came a sort of residual, God, you're just so crap, mm. this particular issue, but just in general. Um, so I think it is. I think he felt like it just wasn't necessarily very good for our relationship for me to be in therapy. Um, but, but but also at the same time, like having a having a baby is puts an enormous strain on a relationship, whether you you know whether you planned it or not. And like you said, like the you know, do, do you see in some respects like that those feelings were valid about Wally? Well, just it, the feelings that you're having in in general between it, 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 in terms of your relationships, maybe with with your husband Wally, your 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 sister, your family that that actually that you were having these valid feelings. Well, 
I think my reaction, my responses to those situations probably wasn't very reasonable. I think, you know, obviously things are going to change. And I think what, you know, my sister trying to be so, trying very hard to be supportive of me, although I interpreted that quite negatively some of the time. Um, I also look back at my other, so like my sister-in-law, for example, who I have a wonderful relationship with, um, you know, I, I just wish I'd been more supportive of her. She had hers nine months before I had mine. She had her first nine months before I had mine. And I just think, oh, I was a really crap sister-in-law. And I, I could have been there more. I should have been there more. Um, and I, it's a regret that I have that I wasn't more helpful. Um, and I don't even necessarily mean in a practical way, because I don't know, you know how useful it would have been. But I don't know, just being there and being available um, in a way that she was was for me. And, and still is um, was you know it was wonderful and I, yeah I mean a lot of time you know when people tell me they're pregnant I do have to rearrange my features into one of yay <laughs> I, I, I do think you know I really hope that no one else or that that person doesn't have to manage cope with you know the sort of stretched out version of what I had and I think my biggest advice to most people is don't discount me. If someone is strongly telling you that they think pills will help you, um, not to discount that experience for fear of st the stigma of taking pills rather than trying it best. Because if I, like I said before, if I'd seen maybe not even that GP, but if I'd seen any GP in a, like in you know three times in a row, we would have got to the point of saying let's try pills much sooner than me going off and trying my own stuff. A lot and so that's not to discount obviously a lot of I know that obviously what psychic is doing is giving you those tools um and I know obviously you do have to try some things but sometimes they just don't work well I, I guess and know, that's fine it's going to help you in your life like like you know meditation and breathing that is going to help you in any scenario but what I guess this whole my whole situation has shown me is that genuinely there was a chemical imbalance in my brain at that time, for, or for quite a long time, that was not, which was left on, which was not treated. And the moment it was treated with chemicals, it was all fine. And I think to sort of finish that journey is that, so that was, I started in January, 2018. Um, and by uh, March, April, March, April, 2019, I was on a half dose with a plan to come off in the summer. Um, and then interestingly, my, my GP, uh, Dr. Andrew said, well, I think you can just come off them unless you've got any big life changes coming up. I was like, well, I am starting a new job in July. And she was immediately like, right, let's just keep on. Okay. If you don't, if you come off them now, start a new job, you won't, and if you, if you find it all massively overwhelming, you won't know whether it's the job or that you've come off the pill. So why don't you wait a bit, keep on the pills, uh, on this half day. So I think also there's some quite interesting kind of, if you go and look for it, reading about, you know, people starting to microdose and getting the, the pills sort of dosages on droppers and things. And, you know, that was never suggested to me. I don't know whether the dose was low, relatively low to begin with, or, or whether it's actually, that's more about the placebo effect, like, or you drop down. Whereas I didn't feel that, I, you know, I was doing half dose and then you know one every other day and I just wasn't noticing any negative impact to that um and so yeah so I came off them fully in October last year um and it's been fine and I think nothing has proved it's fine <laughs> more than being in a pandemic um, yeah uh, yeah what, 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 what a test of res your resilience uh, well it does it does feel that way um because if you'd asked me even a year ago whether or not I would, how I would feel or cope with being at home 24-7 with Henry, even with Richard being here, but he is working so hard. It wasn't, I mean, we were sharing the childcare between us, but when I was on my own with Henry, I was on my own with Henry. Mm. And I never would have believed it would have been as, as great as it has been. I mean, I'm not going to like, it was amazing. I just mean, it could have been a complete bloodbath. Yeah, it's amazing. I would have thought of it. Um, and so he's back in nursery and it's always like it's never happened <laughs> <laughs> so 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 just 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 describe to me so you were on you were originally on you said the 50 mils of search relief yeah i'm gonna have, i mean i have to check that i think it's I was definitely it was definitely not massive yeah okay so so so, so, so coming, but i was on one pill yeah 
In on one pill, I think it's 50. When you reduce that pill, let's say to half a pill, did you notice any difference? No. And I think if I had done, I would have been encouraged by the doctor to go back up to the full dose. So then not noticing the difference and then coming off it because because like you said and I, I i i don't know the physiology behind it so like you've described there was an imbalance in your in your in your head which was fixed in part by these pills then coming off them the imbalance how you're describing it hasn't returned no it hasn't but i think that's to do, i think i'll have to google it but i think that's to do with the pregnancy hormones and various other, I don't know I don't know enough about it I should do anymore that's how I've always thought about it that it's yeah. chemical balance it gets righted why it doesn't then go straight back I don't know but maybe the allowingness that whatever allows you to feel m- more level um becomes self-perpetuating yeah so, so so actually it's interesting it's almost like those pills rather are like you said like they 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 are they're there permanently to correct a level they are there to facilitate a change and a process because yeah. i think that's that's an interesting stigma often people say w- w- when they start going on pills that they're never going to co- come off them but actually your experience was that was a very defined and uh, and um uh, prescribed um, intervention by a very knowledgeable doctor, Dr. Andrews, where that she, where she was saying, yes, okay, there's trial and error in terms of when you're going to reduce your dose and come off. And actually, this was quite a, a fixed period of like, yes, you're yeah. going to do this for X amount of time. And, you know, n- now it seems a good time to come off and you're feeling better. Absolutely. And I think that she, I think, I think she always saw it. I don't know whether she articulated that to me at the beginning, um, but she definitely, I, my, my sense was, you know, her, she, I remember her text, she said it more than once, if you need to be on them until he goes to school, that, you know, that's not uncommon and that's fine. And I think that, I don't know why that's some kind of like, oh, they're going somewhere full time, but of course he's in a nursery from eight till six. Mm-hmm. School is nine till three. There's no, you know, actually you would see, I'll see more of him once he's at school than I do at the nursery. Um, so I don't quite, oh, and I'm in the holidays. So I don't quite know where that kind of cut off in her head came from, but I think she just thought, and she knew I was, I was working, I was working actually at that time three days a week. So I was having two full days with Henry um, on my own, obviously weekends as a family. Um, but, you know, and it's not like there are never, ever any, you know, sort of outbursty episodes. That definitely does still happen to me, um, but not as uncontrollably and not as often at all. I can, I can once, twice, let's be honest, twice in yeah. the past, the real proper lockdown period where I was like, I need to get out of the house and get away from you. Um, uh, leaving him obviously safely with my husband yeah. uh, because you know uh, uh, and actually of course that's to do with him growing up as well and being genuinely a more reasonable being and more and more com- better company and more interesting to be around um, and and that relationship changing and improving but there was definitely a real change in our relationship um, and you know, that, that's only been positive. And yes, yeah, so Dr. Andrews definitely, I felt like it was finite. I felt like she, she wouldn't have wanted it to go on and on and on. Mm. And if I had done, that would not have been because I needed it. It's because I would have thought that I needed it. So there was definitely an element of that I shouldn't be afraid to come off them or try coming off them. And, you know, I just did what she told me to do. She said to go down to a half dose, so I did. Um, and like I say, I'm sure, and she did, you know, then it was, you know, make sure that, the people around you, Wally, knows that you've gone down to this half dose so that they often, people, other people will notice sooner than you will about whether or not things are different. And what I will say is having said, so I had um, literally not a single bad side effect. Well, actually it's not quite true. Loss in libido is a side effect of being on a surgery. It was one I was willing to cope with. Mm-hmm. Um, but so that's the only, literally the only negative thing I can think to say to, to say about them. Um, and whereas lots of people say, well, it takes a good few weeks to settle in, yada, yada. I didn't have any of that. And again, uh, I remember my doctor friend, when I said to them, you know, I started taking them and within three days, I felt amazing. Yeah. She said, well, God, that must have really been the right solution for you. And she, she's a GP herself, a junior, a more junior GP. So she you know, is gathering that experience. Um, and 
Yeah, and they're saying, well, that, you know, that must be, it must be, that must be it. It must have been exactly the right thing because it wouldn't have worked so quickly and so yeah. well if it hadn't been. So again, that sort of is what I, leads to my credence in there was this imbalance and it needed. Mm -hmm. And who knows? I mean, you know, the only regret is who knows what life might have been like if I'd gone on those pills that first time I went to see a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. um, have you found that now? I think Sorry, please carry on. So, um, um, have you found that, you remember like in your first couple of years, you were trying lots of different exercises uh, that, weren't, that weren't the pills themselves. Did you find that when you, ca when you came off the pills, have you gone back to doing some of other kind of, the, kind of like you said, the breathing exercises, the coping thing, or actually, did you not need any of these? I don't routinely use anything. Um, I think probably the only thing that I do, and I definitely don't do enough of it, and it's really interesting the difference between women and men, I think, in this sort of scenario. Um, and I don't know if you've seen in Michelle Obama documentary where she's yeah. about, um, Barrett going off to the gym when she's got these two kids at home. She's like, what the hell? Why are you going off to the gym? And she's like, oh, I just realised that I need to carve that time to go to the gym. Mm gym is not what I want in this in this scenario it's more time with my girlfriends and some wine but actually just saying you know Wally has no um fear probably isn't the right word but he has no uh, reticence about saying I'm just going off a cycle right now yeah he wants me to have that same lack of reticence where I'm all like oh but you're working all week and you work really hard and now I'm just gonna push off and leave you looking after Henry and of course now he's four, he's nearly five um, you know, it's not really a hardship to be looking after him. Right? He can yeah. get on with his own thing quite a lot. Um, so it's not quite that kind of, uh, you know, throw the baby and run out of the door situation. Um, but I, I still think I'm, something I've already got to work on, I guess, if there's anything about tools, it's about, it's about carving that time for myself and being basically selfish. That's actually what that's, I mean, I was fine that way to say it, but that's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. My husband is, is very happy to prioritise himself the needs of the family and indeed Henry directly to to keep himself well and let him exercise might be part of that but I'm pretty sure it has a mental you know a positive effect at the same time yeah. going out cycling or going out running isn't just to keep him fit it's obviously his space and bringing time that he needs and I almost feel like I don't have the, the, the excuse I'm not mad into going and doing exercise I don't really have that, like, oh, I'll just go for a run. Sometimes we tell Henry that's what I'm doing, even if I'm not <laughs> going for a run. Um, just means that I'm not questioned by Henry about what I'm doing and why he can't come with me. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but like you said, like, that, that to realise that it's okay to be selfish. And actually, it's not a you know there's 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 no guilt to be had with that. Now, of course, of course, of course, of course, there is guilt at the time. You're thinking, oh, should I be doing this? Should I be doing this? But did you find that after carving out a little bit of time, like you said, just going go, going to going to see your girlfriends and having some wine, that actually you were able to come back into the situation, uh, has mentally refreshed? Yeah, exactly. And and for me as well, you know, things, even just things like working. Um, you know, I think I probably felt like I should have, you know, be part time. And I was only I was three days a week in my old job, and now my newer job. Um, I do four days a week, and I thought, you know, it was that fair on Henry to do more days at work. But actually, really, I w I just again prioritised myself a bit more. I was actually, this is you know, I'm going to start needing to do. I want to do more work. I'm enjoying what I do. Yeah. And, and he isn't going to suffer by seeing his mother working. That's actually yeah. a really good thing. I should focus more on that. True. Um, rather than any sort of potential or, you know, we really used to enjoy our Thursdays together. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously now, and then actually, like I say, he's going to be going to school in September and so he won't have any days with me. Um, and, I, and I'm suddenly, I'm suddenly going to have a day to myself. I'm still going to give you four days. Uh, okay. And what are you going to do in that day? I'm worried I'm going to do a bit of work actually, because even now I find myself working on Mondays. He's, I, gave, I was supposed to tell my boss yesterday, he said, Henry is actually giving me a genuine guilt trip. But Monday is not a work day, mummy. When I was like, <laughs> um, being held to account, held to account by your four and a half year old is, uh, is <laughs> um, stirring stuff. <laughs> I think I think I will just be like, yeah, just be able to be, be able to be a bit more selfish. Um, and, and like I say, it's about that balance as a couple as well about being selfish and 
you know, no matter whether, although you know, for a long time, so for I said to Wally the other day about how, you know, when he, obviously he spent a lot more time with Henry in, in lockdown than he um, ever did before. You know, he was normally out of the house before Henry woke up and back after he got back to sleep um, for most of Henry's life. And suddenly now being around so much more, but I'm still like, yeah, but I spent a year doing this. Like you think that you're, you've done loads in the last 10 weeks, but actually, um, you know, you've still got a lot of, a lot of ground to make up. I have a, I, I must say, I have a very similar experience. My, uh, I was doing childcare during lockdown. Uh, I claim that I did childcare for six weeks. My wife corrects me and said it was actually 21 days. And does that compare to the 365 constant days where that, uh, and, and no, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. One thing it does do, and, you know, and uh, I've, you know, we've got, I've got n- n- no idea about what, um, what Wally thinks on this, but it certainly gave me an appreciation and in some respect, and a huge respect, an awe of what what my wife and what our wives ha- have been through the last twelve months. I'm not sure me sitting at work um, gave that appreciation at all, to be honest. <laughs> I don't, I work's don't, the, work's I don't the easy part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I and that's why I was thrilled when I went back to work. I mean, that definitely. That, I mean, if I look, if I was looking at my timeline, I think September 2016. I didn't seek another intervention from a from a healthcare professional in February 2017. So I had a good seven months where actually I was feeling seven months where I was feeling quite okay. And I'm pretty sure being back at work had a lot to do with that. Um, because suddenly I was I could focus and I was, you know, could do well and have control at work in a way that I just wasn't really having at home. Mm. But I just I think there's nothing conscious that I nothing truly conscious that I do. And actually when we went, you know, I'm sure it'd be interesting to ask Wally what he thought looking back at, it, back at it all because it doesn't it doesn't feel like a clear and present situation anymore in the way that it was 18 months two years ago and even i mean just like and he would say very much the, you know, the, the, the transformation from being on the search for them um i think crystallized things for him in that you know actually it just should never have got to that stage yeah. later on um, because that was going to have affected me more negatively and possibly Henry. Well, you know, we won't know the impact it's had on Henry. Yeah. Uh, I, do, I, I do sometimes think about that. I think about, you know, wh- whether you won't, have, I mean, you won't have any memories as such, but whether or not there will be some, you know, we'll be talk- whether he'll be talking in 15 years' time about his ghost in his nursery of having a mother who actually was just not very well. I mean, Side effect. I got very, very thin without a try at the time. Yeah, when I after, when he was eight, seven or eight months old, I was absolutely minuscule. Just not again, nothing conscious about not the eating, but just and you know, whenever I think about, I, I now even now I can't associate with being at my thinnest with being happy about being thin or anything else. I was just because it was so it's so inextricably connected to. Um, being unwell with that hindsight I didn't feel it at the time but, um, it, it's interesting you use that word that kind of that connection it's 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 everything you've described there seems to be there seems to be everything seems to be connected in some respect like you said like you're talking about the your you know your perception and how you operated in terms of your relationships with family but most most important with henry there's a physical element like you said nothing nothing conscious but your in some respect, like you said, when when you were feeling very very low, your body, like you said, you know, may or may not have responded, but you said it did respond quite significantly to 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 yeah, that. I mean, one doesn't changes. know about how breastfeeding etc. impacts on that. I know obviously one does, but I just I have never. I think I don't think I've ever been that light, that that thin. Wally quite Wally quite liked it. I keep reminding him. You do remember I was actually. But that's not how it felt, you know, I didn't think at the time, it wasn't like, because I wasn't being, wasn't prescribed anything at that stage, you know, nothing actually was diagnosed until a good 18 months later. That's how, you know, by that time I had rediscovered the joy of crisps and chocolate. But I just, I just had no appetite, um, you know, totally unconsciously and unthinkingly just wasn't eating as much mm. or have some sort of miserable episode that would mean that I would just go to bed really early and not eat. It was just sort of, there wasn't that, yeah, I don't know, I quite remember, all I just, I mean, that was definitely the output. Um, yeah, but, but, but it's interesting, you, you, you said finding the joy of crisp and chocolate, like, 
there's so much joy in crisp and chocolate <laughs> and, and 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 that joy shouldn't be you know it shouldn't be kind of pushed away or said no you shouldn't be eating this like i think if something we've 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 certainly like, oh, I, I, i've certainly come to understand is yes it's great to have a healthy diet and stuff like this but sometimes everyone needs some crisp and chocolate everyone needs a burger everyone needs yeah, but i think that's a sign of how ill i was that i wasn't even finding joy in those things yeah fair but point I would have done like that like that it's not like i've been a sort of like serial denier or anything like literally yeah. all that would have been normal to talk to james <laughs> about um about our, our relationship with chocolate <laughs> but, but um, it's interesting you say that kind of that absence of joy like you, you've you, you've mentioned that a couple of times that you could really could you feel at the time that there was no joy yeah, I mean, I remember Wally saying to me, I just want you to enjoy it. What, what about this situation is there to enjoy? Mm -hmm. And even, and, and also feeling really quite very resentful towards Henry, that even any aspect that I might want to enjoy, like I remember his, I mean, going with Wally, I used to take him swimming, um, doing like the water babies thing when yeah. they're about, about 10 weeks old. And, you know, doing these whole plans and go to the swimming, I'd feed him afterwards, I'd take him for a walk, he'd be asleep, and his and Wally's parents, who lived close by to my parents, would have us over for lunch. And I remember getting there and sitting down to have this lovely suit that his mother had made, and then Henry woke up and started crying. And I was just like, I have done everything to make this situation not stressful for me so that you can sleep while I eat, and then you can play or whatever. I'll be looked at by your grandparents while I'm on the sofa. And you have ruined it. Mm -hmm. And just that, that resentful feeling. And it wasn't even like I was, you know, dying to spend time with all his parents. I loved them very much. But, you know, that was like, it just, I probably would feel even worse if I'd been with my parents who I actually didn't know. But it just that feeling of, you just screw everything up about Henry, not me. It's, it's, it's just so hard. I, I felt like I'd done everything. I'd, I'd planned it all. I'd look, I know, I'd looked at the data over <laughs> from the previous weeks, what had worked best. Yeah. I thought was going to work and it didn't and I think again that just sums up and what I you know again like I said I don't think I had I don't feel like I had any um instances of mental health problems prior to this but I there are clearly aspects of my personality that are just not compatible with not being in control of things mm. and or, or liking that control and this being one of the few times that I genuinely just had almost zero control and the, the times when I felt best when I got sleep trainer in those were all positive times but in some ways one could one I'm sure other psychiatrists would argue that by putting in those measures like having a sleep trainer who said just do just follow the fucking routine just do exactly what I tell you and the joy of being able to hand it over to someone else that's what this is what's contradictory just someone telling you hey fine to leave your baby to cry um, and b just do this just do exactly what it says on the sheet and it will work and I did and it did work, which is why I always tell people to get a sleep trainer yeah. um, or to get someone or to sort of send them copies of them. I don't wish I could down the 300 quid or whatever it is for a couple of hours work. But people, pictures of the, of the routine, I'm like, just do this. Just do it. Yeah. It's another baby. It doesn't matter. She had no interest in Henry whatsoever, other than that he was big enough to not be fed on demand. Yeah. And, and so that's what's weird. So wanting control or wanting to be given control by someone just telling me, this is what you need to do. Do this and it will work. And, and and you say you say about like those, those that kind of insight into yourself. I assume maybe rightly wrongly that you've 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 going through this experience, you've you've gained more understanding of yourself. Definitely, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's not it's not it's not a way I recommend people having massive insight into themselves. Yeah. But, um, and you know, and what I would say is is that Henry will Henry will be an only child. Um, Partly, as I said, I, there's nothing I want to go back to, but equally, there is a fear, and I think a rational fear in this instance, um, it could be a lot worse next time. It might be better, but I don't have a yearning enough to test out that theory. Yeah. Um, so, and, and luckily, Wally's on board with that. Because, because because actually, I was, I was, I was going to I was going to come back to that because you've you mentioned that a couple of times. Like, you know, there are a lot of you know a lot of couples you know especially in 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 well actually all over who th th feel pressure to 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 have the second or the third or whatever it is but actually acknowledging where you are and saying hold on we've we've got a you know we have a happy healthy family we've had this very intense situation and actually i i you know i i, I really don't want to go back to that that's okay right yeah well actually um every now and then i've had a wobble and then i discovered a really good book every time i think about having a wobble i read again 
called The Freedom of Having an Only Child and the Joy of Being One. And it's written by an only child herself and mother of an only child. Um, and she basically takes all the myths about only children, that they are lonely, selfish and maladjusted and um, debunks all of them. Fascinating. It's an absolutely brilliant read. And actually okay. makes it quite funny and I really recommend it. But it's, um, and I remember, I remember my, uh, well, I won't name her, someone I was talking to about this when I said, I think she was maybe in charge. Said, oh, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be really, you know, you've got to think about whether or not, you know, they might be able to share, you might be able to share and also you want to think, you might, you might ask one day. And I said, name, um, you're an only child. Did you ever ask your parents why you're an only child? Oh no, I never have asked that, I never would have asked that. It's like your generation, but I was like, okay, so there you go. And I was like, do you have problems sharing? No, just kidding. Oh, well, there you yes. go. He spouted crap at me about what you think about any children, that you are one. That's it. You can't even disabuse yourself of these tropes around only children. What it does mean is Amazing. that I'm now and then by inviting his, our next door neighbour's kid to play, because, but then I can send them home again. That's a joy. I don't have to deal with any fighting afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, I am more conscious about some of those things that Henry, you know, and actually I feel, I feel most sorry, which is ridiculous, for Henry's potential children who will not have any cousins, which is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. But Henry is one of eight, just on my side, eight cousins who all live in, in where we live and in the same town in southwest London and see a lot of each other. And in fact, all three of them are going to be in the same class in a primary school in September. Oh, amazing. Thank God they've all got the same, not got the same surname because that would be <laughs> village interbreeding level weird. Um, but, you know, he's benefiting from this. One of the reasons, again, that I don't feel too worried about it is he just have wonderful cousin relationships. He's very social. He gets good making friends, etc. I feel sad that I'm sort of consigning future generations to something that he's had benefit from. But that, again, that's ridiculous. He might not have children. Anything can happen. Um, so that's, it's, it's, I know that is a bit irrational. And that's me just always, uh, I think, forward a lot. And I, could, I often catastrophize, I think. Like it's the worst possible situation. But weirdly, I've got over the, the worst possible situation of him being an only child, being negative. I don't. I, I think it's only positives. And um, if anything, I'm now more probably, a, I would say, an advocate of having an only child. And yes. um, again, the, you know, <laughs> what I did say to someone is that this lovely book that I rave about to everyone is wonderful. It does, of course, not mention anything about what the hell to do in lockdown with the two when you've only got one. Yeah. Actually, I've got friends whose kids have been fighting nonstop. Um, of kids, friends, kids who have really bonded and it's been lovely, but you just can't know and there's no guarantee of loving your siblings. Yeah, um, and, that's, and that's a particularly unusual situation, which we hope we don't have <laughs> to go through again, ever. We can only, only hope. <laughs> um, but we have, that's the thing, you know, and like I say, I think, um, yeah, I just, yeah, I definitely, I just, I don't, who knows? I have said to William, oh my God, what if it hits me like some sort of weird biological train that we always have another one and then there'd be a massive age gap, but I don't, I feel like I'm, I'm really, I think it would be a lot harder decision to make if there was a bit of me that was desperate for another baby, but I just have those yearnings. And, and it does make me wonder, how did I have them when I was 31? Like, what, what was it about being 31 that made me know I've got to have a baby? And actually, even now, I'm not convinced it was an innate biological need. I think I just thought that's what happens next. Mm. So, I'll, and I will never know whether or not actually if I'd really thought about it in a different way. Yeah, I don't know. I just hard to know whether I'm fundamentally unsuited to having children or um, actually this is the way it was always meant to be and, you know, hmm. I'll grow into it. I feel like I have. I feel like I've grown into it. In the last well, point. I was going to say it sounds like you have. And, I, you know, I just want to say as well, like, Kate, thanks so much for thanks so much for being honest and candid about, you know, about your your journey as well. Like it's, It seems like those I mean, I can't imagine what you went through those two and a half years and then and that frustration and not just a frustration of of of, of like you said of 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 routines of, of generally having a baby but those feelings and conflicts that go on you've kind of you've you've really painted the picture of <laughs> the group isn't it let's hope no one listening well, uh, having a baby well yeah but, but but i think these this is this is i mean i i was doing some research earlier and in the research, it says between 10 and 15 percent of people experience postnatal depression. There's a charity for children that's come out and said that actually, based on a survey of two and a half thousand mums, about 30 percent experience postnatal depression. So that's suggesting that 
fifteen percent of people who 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 bear a child have have an undiagnosed or unreported postnatal depression mm. which is staggering so I, I i think what you're describing how you're describing and 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 the way that you describe it in terms of how you felt in terms of being uh, the in, some of the kind of the early interventions then the later intervention in terms of the medication that have made such a difference that's 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 going to be very powerful to people to, to, to in it listening and it's not just one in a thousand people that is 30 in every 100 p- mothers Mm. And I think also that. interesting about that is also, you know, you hear the word depression and you think, well, I, I thought low mood, weepy, and I guess I was those things, but because I would genuinely still say my overriding emotion was rage and anger, that that isn't something that's reported on either. Like that, that, you know, if you think about what am I looking out for, that my, my range of emotions wasn't on, didn't feel like it fitted with what most people who were going through it were describing. So I think that's the other thing is that maybe, you know, and because there's all this, well, you've got to expect to feel very different, but where do you draw the line between I feel different and I shouldn't feel this different or I shouldn't feel this different for this long? Um, and that, but, I don't know the answer to that. But, but, but in your particular situation, your, re- your, your, your tip with that recommendation is, is go and seek that help. Um, as yeah, early and as I think possible. try and be a bit consistent about it as well. Yeah. I think the biggest damage, in a way, if one can call it that, but it sounds a bit dramatic, but was that I tr- I did too many things, seeing too many different people, and that n- nothing was able. And not no one's failing other than mine, I guess. That uh, the dots, as it were, weren't joined up. I, I'm pretty sure if I'd seen Dr. Andrews at ten weeks, she probably wouldn't necessarily have gone straight in for pills at that point, but. but seen her again in January she probably definitely she almost certainly would have done yeah. it's that I didn't have that you know that, that consistency the consistency yeah of of seeing somebody who could keep seeing me in you know in, in and I think of course because there is there is a real you know people want to not be you know I remember this book again there I'm just all therapists saying you know, all, all the GPs have got in their arsenal is pills and of course that's not actually true I had a variety of other things but it's how long do you give those things um, and I wasn't I think I wasn't going back and saying yeah you suggested this but it didn't work yeah. it's, it's, it's that it's that bit that, that failed and I, I think in some ways because I wasn't going fully through the NHS all the time I was doing things privately yeah that probably also worked against me a little bit because there wasn't sort of effectively a single record of well she's been back x many times for this many different things and this is the next level on the ladder yeah. that we were to um, and it was and, me just running around going, well, maybe acupuncture will work, or maybe this therapy will work, or maybe. Um... And, and, and what ultimately helped in the end was a very wise doctor yeah. who, who, like, she, did, did, did she have three children herself, did you say? Yeah, she's got, she had three boys, and she said, and she, when I talked to her about it, and I sort of half knew this from my friend in a non, in a non sort of um, breaking the law way, you know, that because she's this, obviously a bit older than me and three boys I think they're now teenagers and she I said you know that she said well she thinks that she had that had the same problem mm-hmm. 25 20 years ago, when I was 18 years ago let's say and it just wasn't talked about then it wasn't diagnosed then so she and in fact she had a special interest in postpartum yeah. situations which was partly I think driven by her personal experience and obviously her professional interests um so and that and that's why my friend suggested I see her and her felt like she was a, you know she was a GP that my friend knew professionally trusted and believed would um be the most useful person for me to see and you know, if I'd seen another different GP that you know I had seen at least two other GPs in that surgery who were all wonderful GPs but because I was seeing a different person every time you know yeah. well, that, right that should all be on a record and that it shouldn't be that it shouldn't be so that we need to see the same person but I think it's about seeing the right person maybe it doesn't and, that. And, and finding that right person you know the first person might not be right but the, in, almost knowing when that is not working and moving on to the next thing but in a consistent yeah. way like you said well i am very pleased that you are you've come out of the other side and you're mm. you know and it's and it's amazing honestly thank you so much for for taking the time to to talk mm. to, to to be so honest about this situation like for, for uh, it's been for me it's been a, a fascinating interesting conversation thank you so much an absolute pleasure. Really, really pleased to you and anyone I can help. I'm always happy to talk more.
awesome um and thank you to everyone listening um subscribe you can subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms uh, youtube spotify apple podcast just search for psychic community or psychic stories and we'll pop up kate thank you so much again mm-hmm.